Good evening and a warm welcome to everyone, also to our online guests. My name is Andrea Steinke. I work as a researcher with the Center for Humanitarian Action and together with Action Against Hunger, we have partnered to present this movie, There Once Was an Island. Um, please also welcome our guests for tonight's film discussion um, on the movie and uh, its main topic, climate change and displacement. First of all, please welcome Khadija Benoit Taf to the stage. Khadija is the vice president of the Impact Social Club, a think tank of the French film industry and impact strategist at BIM, Best Impact Movies. She trains industry professionals and tutors impact labs in international film festivals. She is currently designing the impact campaigns of several acclaimed documentaries. Since 2011, she has been curating the uh, Festival International du, du Film in Océanienne in French Polynesia um, and as a coordinator and communication expert. Khadija holds a degree from Université Sorbonne Nouvelle in information communication and journalism, and uh, uh, holds also um, a degree in art history. Welcome, Khadija. Our um, second guest for tonight is Dr. Kira Finke. Um, she heads the newly founded Center for Climate and Foreign Policy at the German Council on Foreign Relations. She also co-chairs the advisory board to the German federal government on civilian crisis prevention and peace building. Uh, Kira is affiliated as a scientist with the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. She worked um, as an analyst for the German GIZ um, and the Asian Development Bank. She has also extensive field research experience in South Asia, the Pacific and the Sahel region. She completed her uh, doctoral dissertation uh, at Humboldt Universität uh, on the subject of climate change and migration. And she's also a, a member of the Association of Action Against Hunger. So both of them are uniquely qualified to talk uh, with us tonight um, about the movie and its impacts. Um, yeah, maybe let's sit down then. Continue. So um, we will have a um, short discussion among the three of us, and um, after that, you're very welcome to uh, post questions and comments on the movie and its topic. So um, let's start with Khadija. Um, you work as an impact strategist. So um, could you share with us what uh, the impact of the movie was on the lives of the inhabitants of the island? Well, so first, I need to say that the movie was shot 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it has been a long time. Um, the population hasn't relocated. They are still on the island, most of them. Um, the situation hasn't changed much. They still have floods, um, sometimes droughts, and, um, and they're still building seawalls. Um, the impact was, this film wasn't a film with an impact campaign. Uh, but there was there's there's a website. There have been um, um, resources, educational resources, to uh, to teach the Western children what is climate change. With this island as an example, and there was also a fund, a Taku'u fund, for the community, and this fund helped um, bring the community asked for. Um, iron um, roofs and so uh, the, the donors, there was generous donors who gave the means to, to get the roof, the roof to the community. Uh, the impact the film has had is that it has shed a light on this island, mm -hmm. on this atoll and on the climate change problem in the South Pacific. So. Um, it has also brought the, the climate change conversation at the heart of the discussions within the community mm -hmm. because there was this conversation, but it wasn't the main concern for the population, as odd as it seems. The main concern is that they do not have health care. As we understand in the film, there's only one radio to reach the mainland, and it doesn't always work and there is no boats coming in with supply and with foods mainly, mm -hmm. uh, because climate change has, has impacted the, the food system. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so this is 
what it has changed mainly. Mm -hmm. So it's basically the lack of basic social services that are yeah. amplified uh, also by the situation of yeah. um, climate change. Um, prior to uh, this movie, we have talked a little bit uh, already and uh, you've mentioned there are other, um, other effects than raising uh, sea levels, especially uh, within those communities. Could you elaborate a little bit uh, mm -hmm. more on that? Um, so we have, we have the floods, the floods. What's more preoccupating is the, um, uh, the salt, the salinization of the soils, mm -hmm. because it has an impact on the crops and the taro we see, which is the main uh, resource with the fish. There's also a problem with the winds, and the winds are changing, and so the traditional um, fish fishery uh, art has is is impacted by that because the fishermen do not know where to go fishing anymore because of the changing winds. Um, the fish doesn't go in the same places. Um, so these are some of the things. Mm -hmm. And also we we often do not speak about the trolls in the in this region. Uh, and maybe you will tell us more about but what's happening in the Marshall Islands, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is also a lot of Droughts, and this is also a problem for mm -hmm. food. Yeah, maybe just to, to jump in. Um, what, what we saw in the movie is basically something we see all across the Pacific, actually. So a lot of these um, either archipelagic states uh, with low-lying coastal areas or the small island states um, where we have coral atolls, we see similar types of situations. And um, it's, it's devastating in the end. So... Um, There are varying impacts. Uh, something that wasn't shown very much in the movie is uh, coral bleaching and the effect it has on fisheries. Mm -hmm. So we have double pressures of um, uh, the bleaching of the corals. So you have food networks kind of being disrupted uh, in these uh, biodiversity hotspots, uh, which are coral reefs. And then um, you also have overfishing by uh, international fishing companies uh, coming in from China, from Japan, from Australia. Um, who are using the resources that the islanders also use, and um, this, is, this is quite damaging, obviously. And so, yeah, we see uh, on the Marshall Islands, where I did my field research, um, uh, in a, some of the atolls that are also quite remote, as, as this atoll is, um, that uh, there's droughts. Um, at the same time, they have this uh, problem as well of washing over of the island, and as you described, so if an island is washed over, as we saw it, Okay, the water goes back and you can repair maybe the houses, but this is all salt water, right? So the, the entire soil is afterwards salinized and that, that doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. And also fresh water lenses are salinized. So this is um, a problem as well. Um, if you have a drought, you don't have rainfall and you don't have fresh water anymore. Mm -hmm. And also you have diseases that come from altered waters like mm -hmm. malaria or mm -hmm. other diseases, mm -hmm. cholera. So this also refers to um, um, livelihood uh, challenges in a way. Um, Kira, you have authored uh, various reports on the topic, um, some of them relating to the human dimension of uh, climate change and displacement. Would you elaborate a little bit more with regard also to what we have just seen? Yeah, I mean, what we saw now is a community that is basically still very much intact, right? So um, they have a tightly knit uh, communal system, um, they have a functioning culture, they help each other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and this can be severely disrupted by uh, climate change impacts. So if even part of the community relocates, even if just the young people relocate, then who will take care of the land, right? So um, then you leave maybe old people behind, they're there, the other people are here, and they don't have many means of communication, as you just pointed out. Um, and then there's other dimensions. So if you relocate fisher, so we saw this one fisherman who was so extremely skilled, it was so impressive, like all the things he knew about the island, about the plants there, about the fish there, like how he could catch a fish within like a few minutes was kind of amazing to see. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you want to relocate this person to plant cocoa in a, in a plantation. I mean, it's as if you would relocate one of us to like start planting something in a plantation in Brandenburg, you know, it would not be our uh, upbringing, would not be what we have learned, what we have studied, right? So, and um, this is basically the same for them, right? So 
Um, and then this, this has an effect across the entire social system. Mm -hmm. So the skills that place you on the top of the society in their society, so being a great fisherman, that they are not worth anything in this other context. So they, they move basically from maybe being a recognized fisherman, uh, economically stable in their context, to being the lowest on the food chain there basically. Mm -hmm. And this of course disrupts um, the, the structure of these villages, of these communities. So they are right when they're saying like we cannot just relocate to another context. Mm -hmm. They will probably lose their culture unless you know, they're extremely lucky or extremely resilient. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think these are these multi-layered dimensions of uh, climate change impacts that are very indirect and of course also compounded by, by other factors. Would you like to add? Yeah, and also there's this traditional, you talked about this traditional social system where there's a lot of sharing and, not, and no money. And when they go to the mainland, they need to earn money and life is very expensive. Mm -hmm. So it's another problem also. Mm -hmm. of and if we take the discussion maybe to a, a different level now, because um, climate change is uh, one of the main topics uh, being discussed globally, I would say, uh, and also in, in um, relation to displacement and migration. Kira, um, you are the co-chair of the advisory board um, to the German federal government on civilian crisis prevention and peace building. So in, in, in your experience, where does um, climate change and conflict intersect? And what can we ask from, from the German government. You know, we are uh, very close to uh, elections in Germany, so um, what can we do to make authorities aware of what is going on? I mean, of course, art is a medium to make people aware. I guess that's, that's why we're here today as well. Um, but of what was kind of shocking to me was the scene where the, uh, I think it was Australian scientist said, okay, we need to leave some space in the atmosphere, so developing nations can use this uh, CO2 emissions and still develop this pathway and so we need to reduce ours. And this is, as you said, 15 years ago and this hasn't happened. So basically we have, yeah, we have used up most of the space in the atmosphere by the way that we produce energy, by the way that we consume clothes, we consume um, yeah, food, etc., etc. So through, uh, through this, um, we have taken away the opportunity um, for other people to basically industrialize the same way. Mm -hmm. So this means that we are in the moral responsibility to enable these countries um, to yeah, develop um, in another way. So to have access to renewable energy technologies, um, to also basically um, make adaptation possible. Because how is a society that basically doesn't even generate uh, financial income, how, how will they pay for scientists to come in or how will they pay for uh, resources to come into this island mm -hmm. to be able to um, make some infrastructural adjustments that would help them sustain themselves. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's basically unimaginable without outside help, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lack of support from the government uh, of uh, Papua New Guinea, from the uh, autonomous mm -hmm. government or Bougainville. Um, it's for them, and also that is why for a long time uh, the, um, um, the discussion around climate issues have been kind of discarded because they know that the government has an agenda. It's easier for them to relocate the people than to provide resources on the island. Mm -hmm. And so they are advocating for relocation and the population understands that and they see this agenda mm -hmm. yeah these i mean voices. yeah relocation is an extremely sensitive issue in the whole of the pacific and um i think also politically you have to have these two demands at the same time people have to be able to demand that they are they are allowed to stay and they are allowed to get resources to be able to stay um, but at the same time, they also need to be enabled to move in case you really have a catastrophe, as was pointed out in this movie, um, that may just be too dangerous to live in these places. Yeah. And then one, if you don't make, take these precautions until the crisis is there, once, once a crisis is there that is maybe five times the magnitude of what we just saw, mm. then it will be very, very difficult to relocate people. If there's no ships, um, if there's still just this one ship, if the radio communication doesn't work, 
So, um, yeah, I mean, I would be interested to hear if there was any infrastructural improvement made on the island that would enable these people to also be better prepared for natural disasters like this. Yeah. I think it's a very interesting discussion also what you have just said with um, the, the difference between um, being able to move but also being able to stay. There are many other contexts in the world where people are forced to stay in contexts that they uh, can no longer actually live in, especially um, in, in regions in, on, on the African continent, for example. And in this context, I find it very interesting what has been said in the movie, um, those three points of responsibility. Um, other people are burning fuels. This is why your sea levels are rising. And also this factor of costs that has been have been mentioned um, by one of the scientists who said uh, it's uh, much more expensive to relocate everyone than just put new um, seawalls in a way. And then for me, it connects also to this discussion of numbers. We have um, discussed this earlier a little bit because in comparison to other migration flows, for example, um, what we are talking about in the Pacific Islands is a very small number of, of people. And um, how can we, as, um, um, as people thinking about migration and, and climate change, balance all those Factors with each other, you know, in in, the, in in this big discussion on on migration, those who can leave and those who cannot leave. And I would like to stress again um, your role as an advisor to the German government. Um, what can a German government do for um, those islands, for example? I mean, there are running projects, uh, for example, in the Marshall Islands uh, from German Development Corporation, GIZ, uh, that work on sustainable sea transport. Um, and they try to yeah, build canoes, uh, bigger canoes that people can use uh, to transport uh, inter-island goods and um, also, for example, bring uh, medical personnel from one island to another because what happens if, if a woman in this island has a difficult pregnancy? Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's extremely dangerous, right? And even smaller, um, smaller problems. Um, in many Pacific islands, I don't know if that's the case here, because people become so dependent on imported food. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, white uh, rice, uh, people eat a lot. Um, they, they often get diabetes, and this needs to be treated. It's um, expensive, it needs medical infrastructure. So um, there's a whole layer, layer of, uh, of problems. Um, so with, with regards to migration, yeah, I think there needs to be steps taken now in advance for enabling people who are affected by climate change to move also across international borders, um, because as we see in this case, um, the alternatives are very much limited, um, even to relocate within their own country. It's not extremely attractive from what I saw in this movie. So, um, I mean, the question is what options are still there, right? And, um, but as I said, it's a touchy to topic because um, in a way these islands, um, they come with also exclusive rights to fishing uh, around a somewhat a larger zone around the island. And people are also afraid about land grabbing. I mean, this, these are also not topics which were raised in this movie, but they come on top of all of these other issues. So uh, you have land grabbing in Papua New Guinea. You also have deep sea mining, which is now a huge topic, um, the exploitation of the deep seas and um, the grabbing of the resources there. Uh, people want to build resorts in places like this. It's, um, I mean, maybe not in this particular case, but um, I just want to lay out to you um, that there's many layers to this issue and there's a lot of uh, reasons why people resist to move from their homeland mm -hmm. and from the place where their ancestors are buried. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kira. Before I would like to invite uh, the audience to pose some questions, I would um, um, ask Khadija another question on her role as an impact advisor, an impact trainer. Um, what are the opt what are some options uh, for people who are now uh, who have now watched this movie who sit in, in the audience and and uh, are a part of um, this amazing film festival to get engaged to 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 get active uh, with regard to what we've just seen with regard to this island and this population or more generally however you wish I mean ideally with regard to that island but it's obviously um, a bigger challenge uh, mm. than um, in regard to this island and the film, there's a website. Uh, there once was an island.com, and you can go there and access the resources and also the fun. And you can email the producer and director, and they couldn't be here, unfortunately. They're in New Zealand, 
but uh, uh, they send their wishes and they're very happy that the film is screened here. Um, taking action, I think impact in films is about change and it's because stories have an impact on us. We all have, um, uh, we all have had a film who has made us change maybe our behavior or our way of thinking about something, about a subject. Um, and, this is, and this is why we do impact with film. It's because they uh, provoke emotions and emotions make us act on things. So uh, I would say nurture with art and, and, and take action afterwards. Yeah. Follow your impulse. Very wise words. Um, I would like to invite uh, audience questions now. Um, who would like to pose um, a question or a comment to our distinguished guests? Don't be afraid. <laughs> no questions? Okay, if there are no questions, maybe we uh, just engage a little bit more and then uh, wrap it up. Uh, maybe you have some time or more to uh, think about um, some um, questions. So, um, from your point of view, what? Um, how do we go on from that? Like we, as now you're you're an expert in, in climate change. I work uh, on humanitarian policy issues. You work as um, 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 an impact advisor for for the film industry. So, um, what is what what our what is our potential for collaboration as well? What can we imagine on on, on taking this uh, further? Yeah, maybe I can start. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's um, it's the combination that makes this film festival so attractive mm -hmm. of um, talking about science and talking mm -hmm. about emotions, uh, talking about the stories of these people's lives, right? So I think it's very important that uh, we yeah, widen our horizon and, and look beyond what is evident in, in our uh, community to see what other people are struggling with. And I think this this type of empathy will help us to move forward as a civilization, right? Because I was thinking while I was watching this movie was, I mean, where have we gotten? I mean, we are what we consider um, in now modern times. We have so much technology available. We live such a different lifestyle than these people do. But we do this um, with a lot of costs to them. And it's just, I think it's just always shocking to realize this, um, that this is built on the devastation of these communities, right? So I think, um, I think we have to allow ourselves to also grieve this. Yeah. Um, so it's not only about moving forward and taking action. I think it's also to um, what we need in our society now is also to look back, to look at what we have lost. You know, talking about Germany, the lives that we have lost in the Eiffel. I mean, this, this is an event that was in connection to, to um, climate change uh, happening today. And um, we didn't take enough steps to prevent this. Mm -hmm. So I think before we can move forward, we need to reflect and we need to give our ourselves also the time to, um, to feel these feelings and then to um, yeah, make a good plan how, how to change this in the future. Mm -hmm. And we need to adapt like they're doing. And the good news is that they are working on solutions of natural-based solution for adaptation to climate change. And we need to support this mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and be advocates for this, even in our countries. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we can do. And also, um, films, impact films, can, can build coalitions of people, mm -hmm. as you said, with NGOs, with funders, with politicians, with all together, that's how we make the change, mm -hmm. working hand in hand, all together, with our expertise and, and our will and passion. And broaden our horizons as well. I, I, I feel, um, especially 
in terms of also challenging our own notions. We've talked about this, that this is one woman who um, is a very religious person, mm -hmm. and she is the one who stresses um, the, the um, scientists to come to explain to their people, um, um, to her people, uh, the, the facts about climate change. This is uh, something I found very interesting and also challenged my own um, conceptions in a way, um, especially in our current climate where we uh, now scientific facts are challenged by uh, um, other means of uh, perceiving the world, if I may put it like that. Um, and I think this movie, um, for me, um, has managed to, to, to challenge some notions. And already this is something that um, uh, is a very worthwhile and welcomed. And I think, um, Kira, you have put it, we need more empathy and uh, listen to um, um, other people's stories uh, a little bit more. So I think... Those words are very well put. Um, and I see an audience question coming up. Maybe we uh, take the question. And then yeah, hi. I actually have a follow-up question because you mentioned the Eiffel and this change of perspectives that we are having in Europe at the moment, also with the bushfires, etc., which um, brings this topic of destroying our, our livelihoods, our own environment, so much closer. But do you think this is um, like a momentum to change the narrative also, to, to gain momentum, to do more? Is this, would this be enough, maybe? I, I think it is, um, it is hitting closer to home now. So, I mean, we have observed in places like Papua, New Guinea, like Bangladesh, um, also in the Sahel, we have seen devastating impacts for quite a while now, but now we are also seeing that we're not isolated from this, right? So there are impacts that will happen also in Europe, that will also happen in Germany. Of course, the difference is that here the government has at least some ability to step in and uh, provide relief to people, provide uh, housing, et cetera, et cetera, even though there's also problems with that as we hear in the news these days. Um, so the, I think there's, there is a momentum for change. Um, and I think people are realizing that yeah, the climate that our grandparents grew up in is, is basically gone. So we're at about one degree above the normal, above the pre-industrial level of uh, temperatures. And this means more extremes. And the newest IPCC report showed us that temperatures will increase. Um, so we will definitely hit the 1.5 degree uh, line, meaning that impacts will get worse. Um, and we can still stop the worst of impacts, right? So we can still stop the impacts um, such as the complete dying off as the, of the Amazon rainforest and such that would really threaten our, our whole human civilization. So I think it's this balance between the realization that we have to prepare for more extreme weather and also the realization that there's still enough to, to be protected, right? So it's not in vain to now reduce emissions. On the contrary, um, we have to build up momentum upon the fact that this is basically, um, yeah, for, for the future of our children to be able to stop this pathway. And we have to put pressure on our governments. We have, we have one power, we vote. Yeah. So. That is so true, and um, the Germans will be able to do this uh, in more or less seven, seven days, and I hope they were going to make a wise decision. There's another question. Please go ahead. Yes, I also have a question to Akira Winke um, about uh, your research. Um, do you, is there a difference from your research if um, the resettlement or the climate-induced migration is indeed um, forced by a resettlement scheme by the government or um, if the community takes a proactive decision to, uh, to, to make that change or to go on the move. And also um, a follow-up question with regard to um, your judgment on political momentum regarding a climate fund um, from countries who are heavily um, um, remittances of CO2 um, uh, sort of paid uh, as reparations to countries like these who are heavily impacted but have li a little um, yeah, uh, contribution to climate change. Thank you. 
Yeah, so uh, regarding your first question, so the Marshall Islands is a different case. So this is where I did my, my, some of my field research. Um, and there, what we saw is um, a lot of movement uh, from outer islands to the main island, which is already quite a shift because the outer islands are maybe a little bit like this, um, very tightly knit communities living in very um, remote islands. And the main island, Majuro, is more urbanized. Um, and then you have a special case in the Marshall Islands because it's um, the country where the United States tested um, atomic bombs on the Bikini Atoll. So um, they have a history of displacement from that. Um, and also they have um, very close relations with the United States, which enables them to um, move to the US and work there without a visa. So we have a lot of movement from um, the Marshall Islands to the US. Um, and this includes education, movement from education, college education, but it also includes um, kind of this displacement from the outer islands then to Majuro and then work in a chicken factory in Arkansas or something. So you can imagine it's like a very different lifestyle that comes with this. Um, and the people I interviewed, um, they always longed to go home to their own island. And this kind of longing um, for their home was very strong in, in what they described to me. And yeah, it's this loss of, of culture, right? So they don't have I mean, you saw all the skills these women also had with um, uh, like kind of knitting different things out of certain leaves. If you don't have these leaves, you cannot do that anymore. So um, if you don't have these trees, these leaves, if you don't have the fish, like if they can't cook the dishes that they normally eat. So everything is, it's, it's what this scientist said, is like that everything is taken away from them. Mm -hmm. And um, this is really devastating. So of course, there's also some initiatives for relocation, but these top-down relocations, if they are enforced often by authoritarian governments, they often go hand in hand with like kind of human rights violations. Um, they often are not very successful in kind of keeping the living standard of these communities. They disrupt the social fabric. So it's, they are problematic. I mean, there's maybe some cases where it has worked, but in general, um, forced relocations are extremely problematic. Yeah, and um, the second question was, about um, a climate fund and I, um, the question of reparations. Yeah, so, um, well, it was already agreed that uh, industrialized nations would pay into um, the GCF, Green Climate Fund, into other uh, international climate finance. And um, Germany has uh, put up its fair share. The United States, for example, hasn't. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an international effort, right? So it's, it's nothing that Germany can solve on its own. I think Germany could still do more, um, but it also needs other actors to be more involved in this, especially high emitters, uh, for example, like the United States. Thank you so much. Um, if there are no more questions, I would like to thank our um, distinguished guests, uh, Dr. Kira Winke and Khadija ben -Wataf. Um I think we've managed to, um, I hope we have managed to inspire some thoughts and some thinking um, about what, what's going on also with regard to our own context and um, what the, the, the challenges and uh, um, options for research and, and practice and arts are. And um, I hope um, you will take some of the thoughts and inspirations with you and enjoy the rest of the um, Human Rights Film Festival here. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Stay safe and stay open to change. <laughs>